You may have heard of multipass from Ubuntu. If you haven't, then you're probably about to. So I've taken the liberty of installing uh, multipass already on my Windows 10 system here. And that means that as an example, I can run multipass from command line and get some responses. So I can see all the, the regular commands. And since I also have the Windows terminal installed, I can not just get a, a listing like this, I can also uh, select a, a new tab option and see that multipass is there. Now this has an interesting side effect if there are no instances. So we're gonna cover what happens as an example if I do this. So this is gonna actually create a new instance called primary. Um, now you can create named instances, but if you don't, this will just create one literally called primary. And the same happens if you launch the shell. So we'll get onto the launching the shell part a little later. But just as a, an example, uh, this will create a default instance and there's nothing you can do about it. it. It does this every time, unless you already have an instance called primary. So the only way to avoid this is to create one yourself with whatever specification you want and call it primary. So assuming that you haven't done that, then this is just gonna launch a, a new one. So we might as well get into the first couple of commands. Obviously there's a multipass list, which tells us how many there are. And I wanna make note that the IP address doesn't come up there. Now, we'll come back to the whole IP addressing toward the end, but for the moment, we can see that we have a regular Ubuntu image loaded. I can do a sudo app update uh, or any other regular Windows, uh, sorry, Linux commands that you'd expect to see. So this in itself doesn't really give us any benefit over the Windows Linux subsystem per se at this point. But what I can do, which I can't do with the Linux subsystem per se, is I can launch multiple versions of this. So I can go ahead and say, okay, well, give me a new one called um, new Ubuntu. Now you can create multiple instances within the Linux subsystem too, but not as easily as this and not easy to maintain. Um, so there are lots of pros and cons with this approach. The main advantage that I see for it is that you have the ability to launch as many instances as you need and also customize them. So this is something that you can't do with the default ones because they just come as an end image. While these, you have the ability to run configurations on. So you can have a fully customized uh, Ubuntu image ready to basically run without much need to interfere with it. And, and I'll show you what I mean by that as well. So now we've got two instances up and running. I'm just going to close this out. Um, you'll see that basically it remains running. So I'm going to manually stop it. So I'm just going to stop the primary. So this is a, an example. I want to show you the, the stop commands. Um, then you, I'm going to delete it because I have no interest in keeping this primary because it's a default instance. And I'm just going to show you what that means. So you'll see here it's still listed, but in status deleted. Um, so if I want to get rid of that, I can use the prune command. So I'll just purge um, this out and then you'll see it's gone. So that's that's how you get rid of it. You got to use the, the purge to finally get rid of it. Um, so what if I do something like um, multipass shell and say uh, new Ubuntu so this is how we can get into the shell of that instance. Um, it does help if I type this correctly. Um, and, and what this does is I can launch the shell directly on the named instance that I'm choosing so that I can interact with it, same as I would if I had SSH'd into it. In fact, that's exactly what it's doing, is I'm SSHing, but locally through the loop. Um, and you'll see what I mean, because if later on, I'll show you in the bonus section how this actually works under the hood. But short version, um, basically I'm, I'm just connecting straight in to the instance um, as the Ubuntu user. So uh, the Ubuntu user in this case happens to be a member of the sudo, so I can quite happily just go ahead and run all of my commands just by requesting sudo. I could create a new user, um, basically anything really that you wanted. Now, the downside to this is that you really don't have a regular SSH to it. So this is kind of a, just you're running it directly off command line. 
but you can do other things. So you can kind of do like a, a bit like a Docker type style where you can go ahead and create a series of files as an example, like I did, or series of commands, run them from the command line and then execute them uh, without going into the image itself. So the way you do this, it would be basically using um, a multi-pass uh, space exec, then the name of the instance which you want to connect to. So now we've got two again, so we've got the primary and we've got the, the new Ubuntu, so I'll go for the new Ubuntu. Um, and then you have a dash dash, so like a, a minus minus or a hyphen hyphen, depending on how you want to use it. Um, and then the command that you want to basically put into the shell. So this is the ability then to pass that command directly down and get the response back up to the higher layer. So if I go in and I say, okay, I, I'm going to type out these commands and expect a response. So if I list the file system or do an update or something like that, I can actually see uh, what the response would be. So in this case, I did a touch earlier on the file system, so I can do an ls and I can see that the new file that I created is there. Or I can say, okay, I want to go into the var logs uh, directory and I can get the output without opening the shell all the way down. So it's it's using that SSH session to just remotely run the command without going into the shell itself. So you're just getting the responses out again. Uh, and this is something that can really be done. Um, interestingly enough though, uh, if you don't enter the instance name, as you see, you don't get a response. So even though primary is the default when you go to the shell and the other parts, you still need to list primary in when using this um, pass through with the exec command. So it's just something to make note of. Um, not a biggie, obviously, but there are some quirks to that in that respect. That one way it reacts um, as a default and then the other time it doesn't. So now we're going to look at doing something completely different. So rather than set up my images individually, what if I say, okay, uh, I'm going to tell it to run the configuration file. So let's say I'd like some stuff done by default. So I would like, oh, I don't know, user created, SSH, maybe some packages set up, etc. So I can do that by saying, okay, launch me a new one called my cloud. And then I can use the dash dash cloud uh, dash um, init and then the name of the config file. So I've got a configuration.yaml. So nothing super complicated here. Uh, I'm just passing that file through during the configuration process. And I'm just gonna show you the content of the file. So what I've got here is just a basic YAML file, lots and lots of notes. Um, and down here we have a user config saying, I want this user, I want it to be a member of these groups. Here's my SSH. Uh, public key. I want to update the packages, make sure they're up to date. I've changed the snaps around because I found the snaps as per the documentation didn't work. If you use a snap on the other hand with the command that worked fine for me. Um, so I'm using that for the moment. Um, and that way I can get PowerShell installed. So I, in this case, I would like my image to be customized with a user. I'd like my private key to be copied in for the SSH and I want my PowerShell installed. Nothing particularly superly complex there, but obviously this saves me a lot of time customizing the instance every time. I don't need to go in, remember, oh, I just need to copy my keys across this, this, this. So having a config file that does it for you, ultimately brilliant, and I do enjoy that feature a lot. But obviously it doesn't come without some trade-offs. So as an example here, the creation of this particular instance is now going to take a lot longer than previous ones for no real difference than, okay, it's now got to install a package and I asked it to do an update. So in this case, it's now probably installing those 300 plus mega updates in the background. My bad. Obviously that has an impact to the length of this video, but it did complete. So now we can go into this particular instance uh, called my cloud. Uh, well, first of all, we'll check it's running yeah, all good. Uh, we'll do an exec. Let's do, uh, I need to change the name as well. Sometimes I think that it's quicker to type these things out and then I do it the hard way. But anyway, 
Um, so we'll do an exec and we'll say, okay, well, what about give me snaps? So we'll do a snaps list and check if my PowerShell uh, snaps is there. And yes, it is. So that's cool. That's a good start. Uh, what's another one? Let's check if my user is there. So we'll do an ls uh, homes just to see the home directories. So that's there as well. Now I did promise you a look under the hood. Now in my case, I'm using VirtualBox. So this is what this is all based around in my case, but it can also work um, with a Windows hypervisor. So in the VirtualBox, what I've done is I've opened up a PowerShell terminal as administrator and I'm launching um, the executable for what is VirtualBox as the local system using the PS exec tool. And what we can see here is all of our machines are available and they're all natted. So I want to show you a couple of things. First of all, um, I can break it. Um, so let's say that I didn't want to nat my machine. So what I want to do is say, okay, um, I want to put it through onto my local network. Obviously that makes things a bit easier for interacting with it. So if I choose to stop or start um, my new Ubuntu machine, I can go ahead and just run that. These commands will work. They take a little longer than I would expect, but they, they function as usual because they're going directly to the virtual box, telling it to stop or start that machine. So that's fine. Um, now what I think usually happens is it tries to shut it down gracefully using the SSH, but since it can't SSH because it's lost what it believes to be the network connectivity, um, it just uses the virtual box. So as an example here, you'll see the start uh, virtual box gets started and then there's this kind of cycle looping effect going on in the background where it's, it's kind of waiting. Um, now what it's waiting for, I think is, is trying to connect to the local machine IP because I did notice it pop up with this, you know, I've tried to connect to 127.0.1 and it never came back. So obviously that, that changing of the mapping there, the SSH session, it can't complete. And so this just stays in starting state for a while, waiting for that eventual timeout. Um, so that's a quick and easy way to break these. Technically they still run. It just means that command line here is gonna end up a little bit stuck, um, but it will eventually time out and it'll work normally. So you could use that. Um, the other thing that I wanted to note is that none of that's really necessary unless you need the machines to talk on your local network for some reason. If you don't need them to do that and you just, you know, want to merrily uh, use them as is, um, you could put them effectively into maybe a lab network or something that's still natted. Um, but also they all have uh, port configurations already on them. So you could add maybe additional ports if you need to expose an application or something. And again, I'll show you what I mean by that. So if we were to go into the network adapter, we can see that um, there's a configuration here marked port forwarding and the port forwarding already exists. Now that's not going to work for some of the other machines because that's a little bit tricky. Oh, we can see the timeout finally uh, happened. Um, but for at least the one that we configured earlier with the cloud settings, I can just pop on my, a new SSH session, put in the port number. Uh, I have my user and I know that the private key is there and I'm just gonna use localhost and poof, there I am, I'm connected. So that is perfectly fine. That allows me to connect to my machine, do my testing and everything that I want. So unless you have a need for these machines to talk to one another or some other parts, you can kind of get away with just that for the moment. Um, what I would say though is it would be nice to have bridged adapters and um, other settings supported in multipass and maybe that's coming. I, I can't say for now, but it would be nice to. Um, I can also just reset my other machine here just to prove that the connection works. So I can close all this down. So if you can see the command I executed previously failed, but that was before I reset the network. I executed again and it immediately responds. So as you can see, that's basically bound to the SSH session. And I can SSH locally if I need to, to any of these machines, which allows me to operate basically a lab um, with multiple instances very easily without needing to 
manually configure each and every one or do a clean install every time. I hope you found that useful. That was an introduction to Multipass.